Hi, and as many of you will know, we've got another time walking event coming out in the next reset, and it's the Burning Crusade, which brings with it the very first time walking raid, sort of. We did have an updated Molten Core brought out for the 10th anniversary, but that was very much in the LFR mode. This one is going to be needing an organized group, so it's much more like normal heroic type raiding. You have to get your own group, get yourself over there. Now, what I'm going to do here is to go over the bosses from the distant recesses of my mind from when I used to do this myself. I've got some clips of the only videos I'm afraid that I still have. Uh, Black Temple was round about the time, it was towards the end of Tempest Keep actually that I started actually recording my fights. So in theory, I should have all of them for Black Temple. Unfortunately, a lot of them have been lost, but I've got some of them. So the fights you sort of see there don't necessarily tally with the ones I'm going to be talking about, but I'm just going to go through what the key points are. It's not a blow by blow guide to every single one of these bosses. Hopefully, it should be relatively straightforward, but there are some little stings in the tail. So the first boss is Warlord Nagentus. The key thing here is about the spines. Every now and then he will throw an impaling spine on someone. It will completely transfix them and do a load of damage to them. Someone nearby has to click it off incredibly quickly, but then you get the spine in your bags. Now, at certain points, the Nagentus boss will get a shield around him and you use that spine to pierce it and then you can go back to DPS in him. In the days you had to physically open your bag and click on the spine or put it to your taskbar but he's going to mess about doing that during a pull. I would hope these days we'd have an extra action button for it. I'm not actually sure we do, um, but I can't be certain of that. But just be careful of the fact that it may end up just being something in your bags that you then have to click on from your bags. Supremus is one of the easiest bosses in the instance. The main things to be aware of here is volcanoes will spawn underneath you. In the, in the old days, this used to do a massive amount of damage, could easily kill you if you decided to stop and cast before moving out. You move out, as soon as you see something appear underneath you, you are gone. Underlay, arriba. The other thing is he occasionally fixates people now and then. All you have to do here is just kite him around. You've got a massive area if you've cleared some trash around it and also he walks very, very slowly. It's very annoying for melee DPS because you're constantly chasing after him while he's in this fixate mode. Shade of Akama is absolutely the easiest boss in here. In fact, when we originally did this, we basically two-shot it. We were actually fairly embarrassed we didn't one-shot it. It consists of a couple of phases, really. In the first phase, you've got the Shade of Akama, who is like a, a shadowy, ghostly figure, surrounded by various minions of Illidan and you've basically got to kill those but you'll also have other minions coming in from the doors either side so you need a tank located on, a, on one of those doors either side there to pick up those ads people need to sort of DPS those down or at least keep a handle on them at least keep control of them but the key thing is to DPS the mobs channeling into the shade of a karma as much as possible as soon as they break their channel on him effectively he's going to start moving slowly towards akama himself and then he'll start beating him up at this point dps race kill the shade of akama before he defeats akama it, it was a very easy fight at the time i really can't think it'd be anything different the next fight generally is terran gore fiend now this is the very opposite this is one of the toughest fights in there or at least it was at the time. There's a number of things to, to be aware of here. First of all, there can be a very damaging dot placed on people, which can be dispelled, so it wants to be really quickly. The other thing is every now and then you will get, or some people will get like a mark on them that counts down. At the end of it, they're gonna become a ghost. You have to get away from the boss. So you go to the back corner of the room, one of the back corners of the room, you alternate with different people because there is some crossover when this happens. And then you'll spawn into a you'll die you'll spawn into a ghost but like another ghost will spawn around you as well they're going to make their way to the boss they mustn't make it there otherwise very bad news so you've given certain tools you're given the ability to sort of root and snare with also an ice lance ability to try and kill them so you want to try and slow them down as much as possible as well as spam on the old ice lance there the first person who gets this has the hardest job because they've got to do it on their own once you finish killing them the next person will have already spawned. You get a little bit of time left over. You will eventually properly die. Your, even that spirit will collapse. But there's, you get a little bit extra time. So what you should be able to do when that first person's finished theirs, you should be able to help the second person at least get a start on their ads. And then if you get a nice cycle going, everyone after the first person who gets ghosted, basically, will get to help out the person that comes after them. So there's like two people on it for a reasonable amount of time. Gertog Blood Boil, you may remember this if you're raiding Hellfire Citadel. It is similar mechanics, really. He will put 
blood boil on groups of people who are sort of furthest away. So you need like two groups at least to be able to keep moving out. Go be the furthest group out, get a few stacks, then move in. And then another group moves backwards to be replaced. And you should get yourself into a nice little cycle where you go up to enough stacks that it's healable. But at the same time, you're when you come back out and it's time for you to go back out, they'll have dropped off as well. There's regular tank swaps needed, of course, because of a very nasty ability. But other than that, it's a huge DPS race. Reliquy of Souls is also a very difficult boss, or at least was at the time. There are three phases to this effectively, with adds coming in the between phases. The first phase has an ability that has to be interrupted. It's called Drain Soul, or Soul Drain. Absolutely have to be interrupting that one. This phase also has an aura which reduces healing done as well, so you want to get this out of the way as much as possible. Don't worry about if it randomly fixates on you as a melee, that's normal, that does actually happen. It sort of fixates on the closest person. You may need to change who that closest person is according to you know, when they need healing, because remember they're getting much reduced healing, they may need to go back out to get a good amount of healing again. When you've defeated that phase, then it's the in-between phase where loads of spirits will spawn in. You all want to group, stack up, AoE those down. Then the second phase starts. This again has an ability that has to be interrupted. It's called Spirit Shark. You've also got an ability called Rune Shield. You want to be sort of dispelling that with Priest Dispel or Spell Steal, something like that. And also, it, the aura in this phase does damage reflection. So you have to be really careful with your huge damage dealing abilities. It's possible to one-shot yourself. It's actually better to do the much smaller amounts of damage, your smaller damage abilities. You may have to modify which things you use. Particularly careful when you get to executes. Again, once this phase is over, you get the spirit spawning in. So all group up again, AoE those down. And then into the final phase, very nasty. This puts a massive dot on the raid. You're going to have to be behind the boss for this one because it will burn, especially for mana users, it burns mana, which basically means not only does it reduce your mana, but it does shadow damage for you as well. It also does a bit of a fixate ability where it focuses on someone. You're immune to damage for a few seconds after it, but after that you take a massive amount of damage. Expect people to die at this point, but it's, it's okay. You're just killing this boss as quickly as possible. Make sure you're behind it. The person who's it's focused on, you just make sure you move around to what you'd consider a tanking position so everyone else can stay behind the boss. Everyone else needs to DPS it down as quickly as possible. Mother Sharaz is a fairly straightforward fight. At least you won't need shadow resistance this time. It's just as well we ain't got any. Uh, but... The key mechanic on this one is three random effects that it puts on players. So three players will randomly be, first of all, teleported to a particular point, and then each of you has a different debuff on you, and you have to move away from it, otherwise it does a massive amount of damage. And I mean a massive amount of damage. So you all need to split up in different directions. We used to have an add-on at the time that would tell one person to go one way, one to go another, and the other to stay where the bloody hell they were. How you deal with this one at this point is up to you. Maybe someone has updated that add-on. You also get an ability which occasionally throws you up in the air, but that's no big deal, a bit of fall damage. Then you've got the Illidari Council. As the name suggests, and this was the original council as far as I remember, it is a council fight where they've got shared health pool. So you put your damage into whatever's suitable. Now, the Paladin is one I'll start with. That was the one I was on at the time as a, as a Retribution Paladin. This guy needs kiting around. He drops a Consecration, which does a lot of damage. So you, well, as soon as he drops the Consecration, the tank needs to immediately, and any melee around him, because the melee will be on this boss, need to immediately move there. Typically, what we used to do is, you, as you go into the room, the half of the room to the right is where we kited him around in a fairly large circle. There is also a mage boss, which does a couple of things. First of all, can send out bolts, which do a massive amount of damage to individuals, as well as spawning a flame strike, a bit like with the consecration from the paladin boss. You need to move out of that immediately. Back in the day, this was in the days when we didn't always get tanks to tank. We used to use another mage to tank this one so that they could actually spell steal a particular buff, which protected them against the bolts that they used to fire out. There's a rogue boss. This one keeps vanishing and then suddenly leaping on people and applying very nasty dots. You can stun this one. Generally speaking, what you'd ideally like to do is to try and keep this stunned where you can. Finally, there's a priest boss. You need to be dispelling at the very least, or interrupting, I should say, the big heal 
You, there are other abilities it casts as well. You can try and interrupt those, but it's not as big a deal as making sure that you interrupt the heal. And remember, it's shared health pool, so individual DPS will be DPS in whichever one makes most sense to them. And there you go, that's that fight. And then the final fight itself, which is Illidan Storm Rage. Now, if you've defeated Gul'dan on Mythic Mode, you may be aware of some of the abilities because a couple of them are similar here as well. There's a number of phases to this fight. The first one is just basically a tank and spank, really. He occasionally jumps up in the air and comes crashing back down. So you make sure you're behind the boss, not in front, apart from the tank. You can also occasionally get something called a parasite. Now, this works very much like the botanist in Nighthold. You'll get targeted with this thing. Now, you need to move away. It doesn't sort of stun you and then the, the parasite spawns when you dispel it, as in Nighthold. You move away to a preordained spot. It will spawn two parasites which will randomly fix certain players. They mustn't reach them or it will kill them. So what you then need to do is to have someone dispel them. Prefer at the time we used to use some casters with high burst majors to quickly stun them and then blow them up really quickly. Once this phase is over, he will, Illidan will take to the air permanently. You need to get into the middle circle area because he's going to throw down his twin blades of Azanoth and elementals are going to spawn from them. Now, these elementals leave a trail of fire. So what a, a tank has to pick up each elemental and they need to kite them very slowly around the edge of the circle. But they mustn't move far away from the sword that spawns them. You also want, this is the mark of a tank, or it was at the time, want to turn them away from the raid so the melee DPS can actually be attacking. There were some guilds, I know, where the melee did very little damage to these elementals. It was largely because the tanks were not doing a good job of positioning the elemental so that the melee could DPS it without having to be stood in the fire, which does a massive amount of damage. You really don't want to be stood in that. So you just kite it one way, first of all, keeping the back to the raid, and then kite it another. The raid, at the time, needed to be in four separate groups because Illidan would also target random people with a spell which did splash damage. So you needed to make sure that you weren't splashing it onto too many people, but you would be splashing it onto a few people. So there'd be healing required there as well. He also occasionally did his eye beam, which of course our demon hunters have got now. You just make sure you move out of the way of that. When he comes back down, he's again going to do random amounts of splash damage, but to everyone in the raid. So you want to be spread out well. And there's a few things that would happen here. It'll occasionally turn into sort of demon form. You sort of used uh, Warlocks to tank at this point. I'm not quite sure what we're going to do here. But also you would get adds spawning in. The adds had to be taken care of. But very mostly by range because, again, the, the splash damage ability would come in. So if melee went in, they had to go in really quickly and then back space out again. So in this phase, melee not necessarily doing a lot. Then when you get him down to a particular percentage, Maev turns up and then... She starts laying traps down. So what you want to do is to try and kite him over these traps. That stuns him and he takes extra damage then, just like in the Gul'dan encounter. So kite him into traps, massive amounts of DPS. He will eventually break out of them. Repeat and rinse, or rinse and repeat even. And there we go, a dead Illidan. Or not dead, just captured, frozen in amber, fell amber and stored somewhere for fake Gul'dan to come and free him later on. One final point is that apparently if you actually defeat Illidan with the Twin Blades of Azanoth, you get a special achievement for doing that. So there you are. Hopefully that helps out a little bit. It's not a proper guide. If you want a proper guide, I'm sure Wowhead have one. In fact, I should look it up and put a link below if there is. Well, I'm sure there is. There's a, a guide on Wowhead for everything else. Hope you enjoy it. Hopefully I'll get time to have a go at it myself. It is only out for the week that Burning Crusade time walking is available. So if you miss it this next week, then that means you've got to wait for the next Burning Crusade time walking. <sighs> Sad panda. So anyway, hope you enjoyed this. If you did, don't forget to subscribe for further content. And until next time, I'll see you later.